Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you obviously recognise that I am not live with you tonight um, because uh, I didn't realise I'm speaking at uh, the Board uh, of Ministry report at the General Assembly and I didn't realise until yesterday that uh, the report was at, from 6.30 in the evening. Uh, I had understood that it was uh, on Wednesday afternoon. So uh, I'd prepared or I'd most mostly prepared my talk for this evening. So uh, I thought the best thing to do would just be to uh, record it uh, so that you can uh, listen to it and not not try and get someone else at the last minute to, to prepare something um, and that you can then head into prayer and, and we can follow on in the series that we're doing on uh, gospel conversations. And Hunter's very uh, uh, happily agreed to uh, lead the meeting tonight and Hunter I'm very grateful to you for doing that. So really I just want to uh, spend a little time as we carry on in our uh, discussions on gospel conversations uh, to look at loving the lost and the importance of that. Um, the chapter that I'm looking at um, and, and some scripture obviously um, as well is uh, from uh, Matt Smithers book, Before You Share Your Faith, and it's the chapter on loving the lost, which is um, chapter three, and I would encourage you to read that, uh, because I'm not going to be referring to a great deal tonight, uh, but it will be helpful to read it before the city group, and because some of the questions might be related to the um, the chapter instead, uh, or, or some of the points that are raised in the chapter. So, uh, loving the lost, it seems a very obvious thing to say, um, and and yet very important uh, when it and but I do think that when it comes to sharing our faith um, we're always fighting I, well I certainly am and I'm sure m most of us are to a greater or lesser degree we're fighting our natural instincts um, and we have several natural instincts that maybe uh, resist uh, or, or work against us sharing the gospel uh, and maybe the first is safety first um, we want to stay safe uh, within the Christian family. Um, now, that's right, isn't it? Uh, uh, Corey preached on that last Sunday morning about the importance and the significance, the centrality of Christian family. That's absolutely central. Um, it is vital for us to be uh, linked in and, and uh, secure and committed to our, our church family. But uh, sometimes we can use that uh, as... Uh, a reason for being in a Christian bubble and never we're never coming out of that, and maybe we also hear the message of of society with regard to privatization of everything, including our faith, uh, and so we we compartmentalize our lives and uh, we keep our faith to ourselves, and, and we stay within the Christian community and this Christian family, and uh, we uh, just survive in the outside world without seeing the need to uh, take the risks of faith. So safety first is a natural instinct with us. So is actually, I think, for us finding fault uh, comes very naturally to us in our sinful na nature, really. Uh, we look at the world and uh, rather than using discernment about the world, we simply judge the world. Um, we take the place of God. We, we love being in the judgment seat of God. Um, I heard an interesting thing recently which said that uh, when it comes to, and this is maybe a, a different thing, but it comes to our own faults, uh, we uh, act like a defence lawyer. Uh, when it comes to the uh, faults of others, we act like a judge. And that, that's very true, is that we see the sin, the sin in the world around us and the behaviour of people and the immorality maybe and the uh, unbelief and the atheism or whatever it might be, and we condemn it or we're shocked or we recoil and we declare we've got nothing in common and what is light to do with darkness? Uh, and so we isolate further. Um, and yet sometimes if, if we have the wrong attitude in that, uh, we feed that sense of taking God's place and being judges. And it fosters pride within us because we are to discern, we are to, to have a hatred of sin, but uh, we are not to be in the seat of judgment. So finding fault is another natural reaction. And a third one is... Um, uh, fear uh, within us. I'm not going to talk much about fear because uh, that's a subject for another week. Um, but very often um, 
when we separate ourselves from the world, uh, we don't take time to understand people. We don't take time to think about them as estranged children from their father. Uh, and rather, we see them to be avoided. Um, and we become afraid of people because we don't really know them. And uh, we also fear their response um, and their opposition. And we become just paralyzed by fear because we don't get to know and love people. But also, sometimes fear is caused by our longing for popularity. Um, popularity is so important to us. Um, we have no problem and, and no trouble making friends in the world. Maybe the, the other issue, we have no problem making friends with people who are not Christians and being very close to them and, and acting in many ways like them. But we fear their response if we share the gospel with them or share the message of Christ or challenge them in their lives. So we remain silent and fear, again, paralyzes us. So these are some of the, the natural uh, responses of our heart that cause us to uh, struggle to share our faith. But I think it's really important for uh, to recognize that every part of our Christian walk encompasses at least two foundational truths, or two really important truths to think about when we think about the gospel and sharing our faith and, and loving people. First is that we're new creations. We're new creations. Um, in, your, in the city groups, we'll maybe look at 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21, which speaks about us being new creations in Christ and, and what that means. Um, and that speaks about identity, doesn't it? It reminds us that we are loved, that we have belonging, that we're right with God. And we're right with God because of Jesus' sacrificial love. He took my sins upon himself on the cross. And we're part of a community of believers that, that also recognize that and we help and encourage each other to grow in that grace and to um, share together in that identity to encourage one another in that identity and to encourage one another to share that great identity that we have in Christ that takes away uh, fear and reminds us the, the love that secures our identity um, and the second foundation, not just that we're new creations, but that we are being transformed by that love itself. Uh, Romans 12, 2 reminds of that, that we're, you know, we're not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed because of the love of Jesus Christ in us, so that we're not therefore to capitulate to our natural desires, our natural fears, and our natural desires uh, to find fault or to be safe and cocooned, but we're to recognize that God's transforming our, our love and our heart for the lost and also for himself, of course. And we know that that's a battle for us. Um, our whole Christian lives is to recognize that we're to be transformed in our heart and our life and our attitudes and uh, our responsibilities are being turned upside down by Jesus. Very often I think we can... We feel safe and relaxed without recognizing the huge battle that is at work in our own hearts because of what Jesus has done. So these two foundational truths are very important. First, we are loved. We're a new creation in Christ and we're really loved by him. And uh, that love is a transforming love that changes us and changes our attitudes the way we think, not only as we love him and love one another, but also as we love our enemies, our love of the lost as well, however we, uh, term, whatever term we use. So sharing, if we're going to be sharing our faith, how is it that we love the lost well? How is it that we can love the lost well? Well, I think there's a few things I just want to say quickly about Jesus um, and using Jesus uh, as an example for us here. And the first is, is Jesus' own reputation. It reminds us of how to love the lost well. Um, in Luke's Gospel, chapter um, 7 and at verse 34, uh, we have the Pharisees speaking about Jesus, the Son of Man, or Jesus saying in response to the Pharisees, the Son of Man ca came eating and drinking, and you say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's in response to 
his behavior uh, as opposed to John the Baptist's behavior. So Jesus' reputation among the religious leaders of his day and the religious community was that he was a friend of uh, sinners, tax collectors and sinners. In other words, he was known for associating with those who were lost, um, who were regarded as unclean or outcasts um, or undesirables. Uh, he was wrongly accused, and this is very important, he's wrongly accused, obviously, of being a drunkard and a glutton. Yet he clearly committed himself to uh, people who weren't Christians, who weren't believers, who didn't, who didn't have faith. He attended situations of feasting and drinking, and he was willing to risk being misunderstood. And it's very important to remember that it was a misunderstanding. He wasn't a drunk and he wasn't a glunt. A, wasn't gluttonous and I think sometimes we can use that text as an excuse to um, uh, be in the world and of the world as well but he clearly and intentionally chose to make friends uh, with the lost uh, with those who uh, weren't believers and to accept the risk of that and I think first Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 um Verses 7 and 8 also reflect uh, Paul following his master's example, where he says in verse 7 and 8, um, uh, so we cared for you because we loved you very much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So many of these Christians in Thessalonica became Christians because Paul and the apostles shared their lives and became friends with them and maybe at risk to being misunderstood. So Jesus' reputation helps us to understand a little bit more uh, about how to love the lost well. But also Jesus' motivation, and I'm going to read uh, a longer passage here, uh, if you'll bear with me. It's Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. I'm reading from the NIV here, my own uh, Bible. Um, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing he said, you lack. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked round and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible to God. Then Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children in the fields, along with persecutions and an age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And we see there Jesus' teaching, but also Jesus' um, motivation. Uh, he spe- he, this rich man comes to him, and he's just got these lovely words in verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. So he just loved this guy. Uh, and it's such a, a, a beautiful verse that uh, he, he loved the lost, and he was fulfilling his own teaching from Matthew 5 uh, in the Sermon on the Mount about loving your enemy. Good to look at that passage again. And do good, pray for those who persecute you. And so we see his motivation leads him to a conversation with this rich man and uh, the, answer, the asking of a provocative question. Um, he had time to converse with him. Uh, he gave him uh, of his precious time. But uh, in doing so, he, he loved him, but he, he didn't hold back the truth. He exposed the reality of this man's heart, um, maybe in ways that, that we can't in the same way, although we seek God's wisdom so to do, 
in our lives. And, and as we pray and as we depend on the Father, uh, amazing things can happen. Uh, but Jesus didn't hold back in the truth, uh, despite the apparent uh, obedience of the life of this man. And yet he exposed the idol in his heart. And I think one of the interesting things here is there's no evidence whatsoever that this was a successful encounter uh, in the sense of this man becoming, this rich man becoming a believer. We don't know. Uh, he went, but we do know he went away sad. So this isn't about successful evangelism that I'm speaking at this point. It's just about the example of Jesus who loved uh, this man and shared the gospel, shared the truth with him um, because his motivation was so significant. And then from that, we get Jesus teaching towards the end of that section uh, where he makes clear that the, the journey of faith or coming to faith is tough. It's a battle. It's a battle, particularly for those who are rich, maybe even especially physically rich or materially rich, but also those who feel rich in themselves and who don't feel poverty stricken. It's just hard. It's it's hard for them to come to faith and it's it's hard to see results. And even Jesus, the son of God here, uh, his words don't bring this man to faith as, as far as we're aware. In fact, it's not it's just hard, it's actually impossible. You know, the disciples say, well, who, who on earth can be saved then? Jesus said, look, this is impossible with us, but it's not impossible with God. And that's the thing, you know, when we love people um, and what we see with Jesus, is he reminds us that he, he loves people enough just to tell them um, the truth. And, and we need to do that as well, um, even though it's tough. And, but there must be this recognition that our, our love for them is such that we will tell them the truth and overcome the fears that we might have and the natural in, in, instincts that we have, our inclinations, and recognise that our task is impossible. Uh, and it, it will, we will have butterflies in our stomach and we will be opposed even. Um, but recognise that what, what we think is impossible um, and, and is impossible for us in many ways to do both naturally and um, because of the, the condition of people's hearts. It's not impossible for God, you know, uh, but with God, all things are possible, Jesus says. And so it's, it's the reminder to us really that we, we're, we're coming to God about, about this, we're coming to God asking for the impossibility of, of, of loving the way he loves, loving our enemies, loving those who are lost, taking the risks of faith, um, making unbelieving friends, maybe especially among people that are, are social outcasts, maybe are, are the unexpected or uh, those who um, are, are not our natural uh, friends. But, but, but whatever we do to, to do it in such a way that we're, we're willing to risk being misunderstood, but also avoiding compromise you know that's that's why we need the impossible grace and strength of God to do this you know that we don't become friends with the world in order to be just like the world and to become drunkards and gluttons you know uh, in other words engaging in sinful pleasure um, to in the name of evangelism which is, is easy to do it's easy to get into that rut um, but to see how, how great are the riches we've received, amazing gifts we've been given by God, what amazing life we have, and uh, to see that that life is, is precious and is transforming our hearts, changing our, softening our hearts, like, and working, with the nat working against the natural in sinful inclinations out of our heart, not to share the gospel or to uh, judge and be separate from others or maybe even to share the gospel, gospel in a harsh and, and critical or, or uh, loveless way, a, a proud way, whatever it might be. We need, we need the grace and the, the, the strength and the help of the Holy Spirit and God uh, and to take to him the impossibility of that all and to love the way he loves. And when we do so, we know that there will be opposition. He says that in verse 30, along with persecutions. It's part of what we've, we, we receive when we receive Christ. Um, but it's this 
it's this transformation where he says that those who are first will be last and the last will be first. It's, it's upside down. Everything is changing. The rich man, the person we speak to, the friend that we have may well go away sad. But that might not be the end of the story. And the story has not been written by us. Um, we are simply to uh, plough this tough furrow, uh, but to do it in love and to share our faith. And it may be that some people will persecute us or give us a hard time, but we know that others will believe because it's God who saves and God is sovereign. God is us in his kingdom and he uses uh, us to do that. Uh, it's his sovereign work. And that gives us great comfort. We are simply called to be transformed, to depend on him, to love like him, uh, to love him, love others who are our brothers and sisters and love uh, the lost and love our spiritual enemies, as it were, pass on the good news. And that's a remarkable privilege. And um, it's something we need his help to do. So I think often our, our our, our lack of, of sharing our faith is because uh, we, don't, we don't love like Jesus. Um, and that's because we've forgotten it's impossible to love like Jesus without uh, being dependent on God and without seeing the need for our own hearts to be transformed, to have the mercy and the loving kindness and the concern for people that Jesus himself had. So uh, it's just really a taster. There are many things that uh, you will uh, discuss differently maybe at the City Group, but I hope that that has uh, at least whetted your appetite to think a little bit more about the nature of what God's wanting to do in us uh, before and during and as we seek to uh, love the loss, be willing to be misunderstood, but also be willing to be courageous and in love share the good news of Jesus as he is transforming us so he will change uh, redeem and make new creations of others thanks <laughs>